Would you like to have the education, the tools, and the support to create your plan to rock retirement? If so, come join me Tuesday, November 16th at 7 p.m. Central, where I'm going to host a Rock Retirement Club open house. And we're going to show you the clubhouse and the master class, as well as answer your questions. You can learn more and register at livewithroger.com. Hey, welcome to the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host, and this is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but to rock retirement. And we believe you can, and having good habits is one of the secrets to that success. So today we have Wes Moss from the CIA with us, because he has a new book out, What the Happiest Retirees Know. Now, Wes Moss has a number of great books. You can retire sooner than you think. He's host of Money Matters, Money Matters, not Matters, Money Matters, country's longest running live call-in investment in personal finance show. I didn't know that. And of course, he has a wonderful podcast. Wes, how are you doing, buddy? Roger, very good. Excited to talk about the, uh, you know, writing a book is like the spinach and getting to talk about the book is the candy. It's like the fun part. Yes. And this is a great book and it really builds on your other books because you're a research guy. You're a numbers guy that has not just intuited a lot of wisdom from retirees, but you actually do surveys of people in retirement to come up with these pearls of wisdom. Tell me about that journey. For some reason, and this kind of plays out in almost every part of my life, is that, and for so many years before I did Retire Sooner podcast, Money Matters has always been the show of what's happening today. And there's always a big topic of the day, whether it's COVID, the COVID economy, or the debt ceiling dance that we've done in this country over and over again, or big market corrections or crashes and recessions. And to me, I just feel so much more comfortable when I have lots of data to at least have my own conviction around what's happening. And then it just feels, it's just so much easier to talk about it and draw conclusions. And to some extent, that's, I think, what got me down this path of, well, I think I might have some inclinations around what happy retirees might know, but I don't really know empirically what the relationship is between money and happiness. Like how much does it take and how do we spend it and what's enough and how much do we need to get to? And what are the key financial habits that move the meter on our, whether we call it happiness, which is kind of an umbrella word or peace of mind and going and doing a deep dive and surveying 1500 families across 46 states and then doing 2000 families. Those research studies over the years, and it's been about a decade of doing these, It just gives me all this data and then the data tells the story. And then it's my job in the book, what the happiest retirees know is to just take that data and then really draw a picture around it and try to help people understand it. And that to me is the most fun path, whether we're talking about the economy and the markets or this, my favorite topic, which is these trying to reverse engineer the right habits of what to do to have a happy retirement. And then what are the things to avoid it? That's the way I like to approach any sort of problem. And that's what this project is all about. I really like that approach because I'm a boots on the ground kind of person, right? I walk life with about 85 families and over whatever period of time, I don't say how long I've worked it anymore because I'm getting older. From my experience, I pull these nuggets and you're looking at it actually from the top down rather than the bottom up. Usually when I think of this, I think of it from a like regret minimalization standpoint. Bronnie Bryce's great book, you know, the five top regrets of those dying, but yours has data behind it. And I think they actually line up really well of the habits that you outline in your book. Do you think most people pre-retirement have big misconceptions of what they want and what a happy retirement actually is? Yes, I do. When we see people get retirement wrong, And in your, the way you describe it, which I love, which is how do you rock retirement? Yes, I think that there is this concept in America that, and it's very understandable, is that we're going to get to a point of financial security and then we get to stop working at this job. It might be oppressive. We might not love it. And then all of a sudden the sky's open and the world is amazing. And we go to the, it's like we've walked into the gates of heaven 
And the reality, oh, it, that, yeah. that made me, I sound. needed sound effect for that. Yeah. Uh, we need a heaven button. The reality here is that that transition into retirement isn't just some magical dust that flies all of a sudden the minute you walk out of work and all of a sudden everything's happy. It's almost the contrary. There's so many things that we need to do and prepare for beyond the money side of the equation. Otherwise, we have this real high level of disappointment. And that's why there are all these statistics around anxiety goes up when we get into retirement and we stop working. The number of prescribed anxiety or depression medication prescriptions go through the roof. We get this very easy to lose a sense of purpose, more loneliness, and even mortality. Like literally we see there's multiple studies and statistics that show that mortality rates increase in certain periods of retirement or the very beginning of retirement, which is scary to me. And I want to just help people avoid all of those pitfalls. So it's not just like, oh, it's amazing. Retirement's perfect. So there's this misconception. It's driven, part of it is driven by the real world fact that 70% of people in America really don't like the job that they're doing. And for all the talk around, find your passion, find your love, you love your work and you never work a day in your life. That's great. And yes, we're all looking for that. But the reality of it in your, again, boots on the ground, real life, that's not the case. 70% of people really don't love work. In fact, one in five over and over again, this is from Gardner Group study, their work and engagement study. One out of five people hate their companies and their job. They hate their job so much. They want to bring their company down. Like they want to see their company not do well. They want to see their manager fired. They want to see their division uh, have a bad quarter or a bad year because they're misaligned. So the reality here is that that is what, for for many, many people, even wealthy people, uh, very Mm -hmm. often find themselves ready to get out of work. And they think retirement is the answer. And that in itself isn't enough. And what I hear is, and I've definitely seen this individually, uh, most people approach retirement from that mindset you just talked about, Wes, which is just make this pain go away. If I can just pull this out and fix this, I will be okay. When you're running away from something, right? And yeah, taking the pain away is great. But then the human experience is once you achieve that, you're left with, now what? And that's where the floundering comes, I imagine, right, Wes? That's exactly right. So you get this thought of, to your point, you take the pain away and everything's going to be fine. And the reality here is it's, it's just not, unless, unless we really think through what are the things or what are the actions I can take today when I'm 40 and I'm in my mid forties or I'm in my mid fifties and I'm starting to eye that period of time when I get to a point financially, I'm okay. And I've, I've, I have some checkpoints and I like that. I don't know um, how that happened. <laughs> We get to some of these financial checkpoints and we think everything's going to be fine, but there's a long, long list. So in what the happiest retirees know, I have these 10 categories, 10 chapters of really distinct areas that we can have the right habits. But then there's two to four of them in each chapter, in each section. So there's 30 of these things. And out of those 30, around five of them, five or six of them are critical must-have financial items, right? Got to get these financial pieces of the equation taken care of. But the other 20 plus are relationships with and habits that have to do with our faith and our giving and our family and our marriages. I call that chapter love. I'm not a marriage expert, but the whole chapter on love, our marital relationships, the relationship with our kids. And part of this is our money relationship with our kids. And then this thought around our curiosity which is so critical to the equation is that how is our own curiosity help solve for that future bliss, right? How do we make the sound effect of the heaven come on when we really leave work? And that's what I'm trying to help people with here. I like the way that you start the book out in that you define this happiest retiree on the block, each Rob. And that is someone that I guess embodies these habits that you talk about. And you mentioned money, so I want to ask you this. By the way, Roger, thank you for that, because I wanted to actually call the book Happiest Retiree on the Block. And my publisher just would not allow it. They thought it was too close to Happiest Baby on the Block, or people wouldn't understand what that was. And 
I don't know. In the end, they've made some fairly, they've been fairly helpful in the past on titling. And so, but they did let me use HROB, which, yeah, stands for happiest retiree on the block versus UROBs, which are unhappiest retiree on the block. And you're right. These are people that embody all the right habits. And in some cases, the UROBs are all the wrong habits. So yeah, that's, that's the hero the and the anti-hero, right? And yeah. it's good to, to have those guideposts to grade yourself in each one of these, right? When we think about being the HROB, usually we think, well, if I just have enough money, if I just have X amount, that will happen. And you start off and sort of punch that in the nose that it's, yeah, you got to have your money habits right. But talk to me about the fallacy of just having more is going to solve that. Right. So we know, and this would, I would say maybe anecdotally, we know plenty of people that have all the money in the world and still are not in the happy camp. So they may be the richest guy on the block, but they're not an HRO, right? They may have, and I, there's a couple stories I tell in the book around, I think the classic story that I think is so important and, and it's an extreme story, but the John Paul Getty, who let's call it a century ago or half a century ago was the, the richest guy in America, right? And the equivalent of a Jeff Bezos in today's world. And his grandson was kidnapped and there was a big ransom for the grandson and he would not help his son get his grandson back. He would not pay the ransom. He wouldn't pay it, even though for him is drop in the bucket, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it until the family received the grandson's ear in the mail. Oh. He eventually, when it got so bad and imagine your popularity at Thanksgiving dinner, hey, grandpa <laughs> won't pay up little Johnny has been kidnapped for 30 days now. His ear arrived, severed in the mail, and grandpa still won't pay up. Eventually, John Paul Getty did pay for the ransom to get the grandson back, but he only paid the maximum tax-deductible amount in order to get his grandson back. This is not how you build close family relationships, I don't think. All the money in the world, and no, one's, no one wants to be with you at Thanksgiving dinner. And then you quote a study, and I forget the source, that said when you start to get above seventy, eighty thousand dollars in income, the incremental happiness starts to level out. So you this know. is from the the original. I remember brushing my teeth one morning and thinking through this. I had heard, I think maybe it was Dave Ramsey who had talked about this study from twenty years ago or so, fifteen years ago, from the Woodrow Wilson School of Business School. And it said that happiness in America is $75,000 a year, or at least you needed to at least get to 75 or more. And that statistic and that study rattled around in my brain for a long time until I decided to just, I wanted to, to find out for myself. So that was one of these original catalysts for, hey, Wes, this is a gr good concept, but I wanted to, to get em empirically, I wanted to find out for my, myself. So in one of my original money happiness studies, I really, really focused in on that. Happiness relative to, and, and by the way, here's a methodology I've used in almost all of these different studies is that I ask all these financial questions, consumer questions, lifestyle, ha habits, social, family, and then there's a couple of sections that are trying to get to someone's state of happiness. So there's a couple of different questions in here that lead me to that. And from the data, I'm able to take the top two quintiles, which are the happiness four and fives in my book and my research, and relative to the ones and the two. So top two quintiles, bottom two quintiles, and then Roger, I cut out the middle. So I take all the, the people that are kind of in the middle group and then compare those two groups that are kind of in the extremes. And we're able to really discern what the HROBs are versus the UROBs are. And that's how I get to a lot of this research. But what that also showed me is that, yes, more happiness does lead to, I'm sorry, more money does lead to more happiness. However, in my studies on amount of income and the amount of liquid retirement savings, which are two real keys here, there's really an inflection point where it starts to really plateau. There was another study recently, a year or two ago, from Wharton School of Business that showed no plateauing. And it showed that it was almost this unlimited rise in happiness. So more money, more happiness, more money, more happiness, et cetera. My data actually doesn't show that. My data shows that you get a really 
really large and incremental rise, so a lot of happiness per new dollar in these early stages of accumulating wealth or accumulating more income. And then it starts to plateau and really levels off at a certain point, whether that is amount of income per year, whether it's amount of liquid retirement savings. My numbers came back differently the Woodrow Wilson School, my happy retiree group for income. And this question was actually, what was your income in your highest earning years? And it was in the hot, mid, mid to high 80s. So call it 80 to $90,000. And then after that, it really started to plateau off. So we didn't get a whole lot of new happiness per incremental new dollar. When I looked at these habits and I was reading this book, thinking of the hero, the anti-hero, H. Rob and the U. Rob, we do case studies periodically on the podcast where we'll have a listener and we'll walk them through. And I've had people that spend $20,000 a year and they felt like they were struggling to be happy and had a, they didn't have enough money. And then we had one person that really freaked people out where her and her husband lived on like $35,000 a year retired and they were just happy as all get out. And I got a lot of pushback of there's no way somebody can live on that kind of money. And my thought was, as I read your habits, because let's go through some of these habits real quickly. You have the money habits, the curiosity habits, family habits you hit on, love habits, faith habits, social habits, health habits, home habits, investing habits. My thought was, Wes, as I was reading this, is whether you're 30 years old, 40 years old, or retired, these are your core of who you are, Mm. right? If these are rotten, you're not going to be happy and it doesn't really matter the money. But if you have these healthy and you're focused on improving them, so your core as a person operating in society is good, the money amount's not going to matter. So if you survey people that have good cores, yeah, if they have more money, that just means they get to have more tools to do a lot of these cool things with faith and love and family and curiosity. But if you're, you have more money and your core is rotten, it's not really going to help you. I think This is really important stuff. You're exactly right. And I think throughout the book, we do have some sort of financial lens on these habits. For for example, when it comes to family, and this is where the research to me was just, it's fascinating. And, And that's how really I got started writing these books is I did these studies and the research came back and it was this fascinating just to look at the data, comparing the HROBs and the UROBs. And then the relationships between how much money and how much happiness and all these different categories was just such a, so eye-opening to the lives that we live. And this is to some extent kind of what you're talking about, the core of who we are, that it just became so much fun to write about. But for example, family habits. Well, we talk about several different family and money related relationships. For example, the relationships we have with our adult children. And I think I, I wanted to ask this question and get some data on it because Some families I've worked with over many years seem to have the money and their own children figured out. And some just struggle with it over and over and over and over again. Should I be paying for my children in their college phase? Should I pay that pay in their pay for their graduate phase? Should I help them in the first couple years of their life? And then should I continue to support them? And it was very interesting to find out the differences between HROBs and UROBs when it came to how much they support their adult children. There's a significant difference between those two groups. The HROBs of the world spend, on average, per month, much less on their adult children. Even though, again, HROBs tend to have a little bit more in their own finances and a little bit more money on that plateauing Mm -hmm. continuum, they actually spend less per month, on average, than you, Robs, do when it comes to their adult children. And I'm not talking about a family trip or or I'm not talking about Christmas presents. I'm not talking about, Hey, let's all go to Disney and I'll help pay for it. I'm talking about like car payments and paying off student loans and helping their adult children pay for their kids' school, private school tuition coming from grandparents. And it was very eye opening to me. And this is where I think of it practically. So how do we put it in practice? Well, as you are thinking through getting to that next phase of retirement, it's very easy to continue to support your adult kids, real easy to do. But if you know that it actually has a materially negative impact on your overall well-being or happiness when you get into retirement, then you can start making a plan for that to stop or that bad habit stop today because it might take a couple of years. It may not just be, hey, hey, kids, adult kids, no more money from us. It may just be that, look, honey, you and me, husband, wife, we've really got to stop 
allowing our children, our adult children to rely on us. And let's say over the next year to two years or three years, we've got to totally wean them off our balance sheet. And that is one of these habits that I can say practically, we know we should be doing this. So let's start working towards this today so that we're not, you know, hitting the face with it when, once we're already in retirement. That's a great example, right? And it will change the relationship with the children, probably for the better after maybe some turmoil. And navigating that, Wes, is a whole different issue, isn't it? Because you know, I've had instances where the husband and wife weren't on the same page. And so that means you have to have the healthy marriage relationship and be able to have those conversations in order to even address that. Because if there's a fracture there, this can take a long time and you have to be willing to lean into that, right? And that's part of all of this is that all there, there's so many of these, this is a big recipe, Roger, right? So there's 30 ingredients in this family recipe that gets passed down from generation to generation. There's 30 things I want to put in this stew to make it great. I don't need all 30 and I can pick and choose which ones I really want. And I can also choose how much of any given ingredient I want to really focus in on. I liken it to a big recipe that we're not going to all do all 30 things. We may choose 20 or 25 of them that we want to focus in on and improve upon because that's our version of this recipe. That's how I think of this. And in the real world or real life, it helps me as an advisor. And and the core mission that, that I've had in my career is pretty simple. It's helping families find happiness in retirement. Pretty blanket statement, but we live it and breathe it. And the way we can actually use it practically, to your point, actually leaning in on it, is understanding, well, there's a lot more to the, well, let's, we have to get the money pieces right. But then let's talk about the relationship with the kids. How much are we spending on the kids? Oh, wow, that's a lot. Oh, I, you know what? Our adult children, we don't have to spend a lot on. Or to your point, dad says, look, let's just pay, 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 pay. Let's get them all the way educated. Let's send them to medical school. Let's send them to graduate school. And then mom is saying, mm, I don't agree with that. I think they need to be more independent. And then you get this marital headbutting. And to your point that we've got to eventually as a couple get on the same financial and lifestyle page or else we're going to continue to have this consternation. And it leads to some marital distress, which leads to unhappiness. So they all work together. The pieces of this recipe all work together. And when you're using this book to choose which to work on, and I think this is actually a workbook, right? This is if you grab this book and you find the habits where you want to improve a little bit and maybe you find three or four, and I would definitely take the low hanging fruit first. And one thing that my wife and I started doing, Wes, maybe three years ago, because we used to do this in college, it was golf. And then we Wait, gave you it and up. your wife for, both did golf? Yeah, that's what we did when we were dating. We golfed together. Oh, that's very cool. And then we, you know, kids work whatever, stopped. And about three, four years ago, we picked it up. So we golf once a week together with her sister and her husband. So my brother-in-law, I call that habit stacking. You know, it's not my term, but so if you think about golfing, say with your spouse or whatever it is that you do with your spouse, it gives us time to have little conversations where we're not sitting across the table from each other in a confrontational way. It gives us time to be social. And you mentioned this in your book, and under hobbies, it gives us time to be healthy. I like to walk as much as I can, and I'm swinging the club a lot, unfortunately, but I'm working on improving that. And so you can find three or four things and then figure out how to put them together. And this book gives you the, as you said, the recipe, which I think is awesome. I wish Lynn would play golf. By the way, I love golf and I didn't start golf until later in my life. I was, it was about seven years ago. So I was in my late thirties and I grew up with a dad who, for some reason, he's more of like a, I don't know if you've ever, ever watched Yellowstone with Kevin Costner, but like that's... Hopefully it, he's not as mean as Kevin Costner in Yellowstone. He's tough. He actually is pretty <laughs> tough. He's a little bit like that. <laughs> that's kind of his quintessential great life, right? In fact, when I was a little kid, we moved from Pennsylvania. He's a veterinarian. So we moved to Cody, Wyoming. And he was a large animal vet. And, you know, he wanted to be a cowboy doctor. And we moved to Cody. So that's kind of his quintessential essential life is on a farm in the country, in Pennsylvania, he lives, it's a rural area, it's, it's, he's on a farm, he has goats, chick, not goats, he has chickens, and he's got a couple horses and a big garden and a farm. It's a, it's a small working farm. And maybe the best way to say it is that cowboys don't play golf, 
Except I do know of a great story of the of George Strait. Loves to play golf. I think he's a member at, actually at Augusta, and I think of him as a cowboy. By the way, he listens to, when he's in the golf cart, he actually listens to George Strait, his own music. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> That's what very meta. What do you do, George? George Strait. I don't know if there's anything better, and he's right about that. But So I grew up with a dad who just, for some reason, had this real, he thought golf was a terrible yuppie, I guess that's the word he used to use, yuppie sport that you should never do. And so I grew up never playing it. And then finally, about seven years, I finally picked it up. And it's an amazing uh, social activity sport. I love it. Can't believe I lived so long without doing it. But Lynn, my wife, it is her idea of fingers on a chalkboard. She's like, oh, no way I would ever golf. But anyway, it would be fun if she did, but I don't think that'll ever change. <laughs> well, and I think golf is, well, let's take golf for a second because this is, and we're getting close to wrapping up this time because you're a busy dude. Golf is a pursuit. And, you know, I'm like you very, got a lot of things going on, writing books, doing podcasts, managing clients, blah, blah, blah. The one thing I've enjoyed about golf is I'm trying to create pursuits outside of my work because I am obsessed with all the things I have to do. And it's this achievement cycle I have within work. But literally, if I have like five hours where my wife is gone and there, you know, there's just nothing to do, I flounder because I don't have pursuits outside of work. And golf has become one of those as a mental game where I'm it's more of a mental game than a physical game for me, just like mountain bike and I do other things. But I think this idea of having these things that we are pursuing after retirement is one of those core habits, because if you don't, you flounder. Right. It's so core. We need, we all need at least 3.6 of these. You have to have, them, and let's call it closer to four. You need four of these things that you're curious about that either you want to start new, brand new core pursuits are amazing and important, or the ones that we're currently in getting better at. And that's why the perfect core pursuit is something that we can get better at because it's eternal, right? You can always get better at golf. You can always get better at tennis. You can always be better at music. You can always be better at an instrument. You can always be better at art. You can always be better at a particular craft or anything that you're building. And I love those kinds of core pursuits, which are most things that we pick up as humans, if we have the ability to get better and better at, then they are these eternal core pursuits and they are lifeblood. They're like the, they are really the lifeblood of the happy retiree. You hit it on the head. When we talk about what the happiest retirees know, they embody these 10 habits and they don't stop. Happiness, you know, we have this, you know, ethos of happiness of it's some pursuit, some thing you get. It's actually something you live and it's embodied in the habits that you really outline in this book. Wes Moss, thank you so much for chatting with me about this. This is so important. Roger, I thank you for being a guest on Retire Sooner podcast. And thank you so much for having me on your show. You're a good interviewer and you ask a lot of questions that nobody has asked before. So I appreciate it. You bet, buddy. And I can't wait to play golf with you. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too. But remember, you're not our clients. Would not love it if you took advice from yeah, us on we the would show. Not, we would not love it if you took advice from us on the show. Realize this is helpful in education. Talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.